Welcome to our next part of our um, environmental chapter on the global climate changes. We're looking at the carbon cycle, our fifth section in our chapter. And at first glance, you can see that the cyclic nature of where carbon lands in our environment is very important. There's three things at the top of the list here. You can see first, carbon is found in many places in our planet, many different places. For instance, um, you know these reservoirs of carbon occur in the atmosphere, and the most abundant reservoir of carbon would be in the form of carbon dioxide. But you can also see it present in terms of carbon monoxide, uh, methane gas, in addition to the carbon dioxide. All of these are ways that we find carbon in our atmosphere. Another reservoir for carbon is in carbonate containing rocks. So perhaps down here in this area of the earth, we have what are called calcium carbonate or carbonate and in, in terms of limestone, for instance. But here's another reservoir in the earth as a rock and in certain other kind of containing rocks as well. Plants and animals are a third place that you'll find carbon. Of course, any living organism uh, contains carbon. And this time it's from what we call hydrocarbate, hy hydrocarbrates, proteins, and lipids. Sorry, I stumbled. So all these different locations where we find carbon, the next statement it says, this is a cyclic structure. Carbon is on the move through processes such as combustion or photosynthesis from the plant, sedimentation, carbon moves from one reservoir to the other. And then the third one says where carbon ends up matters. So we could have a slow transformation of carbon from living organisms into fossil fuels. And of course that uh, production would take millions of years under high pressure but getting the carbon back into the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels is a very quick, very quick way to change the location of the carbon. So here we can see that as a cyclic nature, we have many different opportunities to keep moving carbon around and around. This particular graphic of the global carbon cycle shows the quantity of carbon expressed in gigatons that is stored in various carbon reservoirs and it's moving through the system. So we see certain dynamic forces that bring it out of the earth back into the atmosphere and from the atmosphere back into the earth and water and sediment and so forth. So the global carbon dioxide emission, this carbon dioxide, the largest component of carbon in the atmosphere, is of course what we've been focusing on in terms of global warming. And we begin to talk about the quantification of carbon. How much carbon do we have in the atmosphere? In our next few topics, we're going to be quantitative topics. We're going to need our calculators out. We're going to be introducing concepts of mass and moles. So a quantitative section in really just to discuss carbon first, when we're going to explore a larger chemistry concept, how do individual atoms weigh? How, how do we get their weight? How do we define the gram atomic mass? What is Avogadro's number and what is it used for? How about the molar mass of a certain compound? and the chemical mole, that counting unit we use in chemistry. So let's begin kind of just discovering what we know so far from the periodic table. And since we're focusing on carbon, I remember carbon here on our periodic table is number six and its mass number 12.011. So I want to just kind of set the stage of what that means. If we have a carbon, atomic number six, and I'll put mass number of just 12.00. One atom, a single atom of carbon, would have a mass number of what's called 12.00 atomic mass units, an AMU. A single atom of carbon would weigh 12 atomic mass units. We understand that this mass number is derived, you know, from a previous lesson by the number of protons in the nucleus with the number of neutrons in the nucleus. We would have six positive protons, 
six neutral neutrons and then we remember our electron distribution outside we go two and four to create an electrically neutral atom so the weight of the atom here would be 12 atomic mass units but how convenient is it to weigh individual atoms? So if the mass number is 12, each atom consisting of 6 protons and 6 neutrons is 12.00 atomic mass units. Knowing that we have different isotopes as well, I could, we mentioned isotopes in our last chapter. They're the same atom but just different numbering of neutrons. Here's a carbon atom that would weigh 14 atomic mass units with 6 positive protons and 14 minus 6 is 8 neutral neutrons. But we begin defining something called atomic mass right here and it's going to equate the weight of a single atom to the weight in grams of a whole lot of atoms known as a mole, a counting unit. Atomic mass is the mass in grams how many grams would it take, the mass in grams to have exactly one mole and I need to define this next I know that if carbon weighs 12 atomic mass units and I went and weighed out 12.00 grams of carbon not a single atom would be on the scale correct a single atom would hardly weigh anything, correct? I mean, 12 atomic mass units is a very, very, very tiny unit. How many atoms would I need to put on the scale for carbon so that by the time I was done weighing it, it read 12.00 grams? Well, this is what's known as its atomic mass in grams. I'd have to weigh out exactly 12 grams. Carbon's atomic mass measured in a gram. How many of those atoms would actually be on there? And this is me introducing for the first time known as Avogadro's number 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms would be sitting on that scale giving me one whole mole, I spelled that backwards, giving me a mole of that particular compound. So Let's review. I'm going to show a visual to help me describe what I've been saying. I know that when we measure matter, there's three different ways we can measure matter, and not just really in a chemistry class, but anywhere you can measure matter three different ways. You can count, and in chemistry when we're counting these individual representative particles, think of those individual particles as either atoms, or molecules or these ionic compounds called salts. So we have atoms or compounds known as molecules or ionic compounds. So these two categories are something a little bit bigger. We know that atoms can group together to make compounds. So I'm going to say one way of of measuring matter is by counting. So for instance, I go to the store and I buy uh, 12 eggs. What is the word that designates 12 eggs? Well, it's the word dozen. When I buy a dozen eggs, I bought 12 eggs. When I buy a dozen donuts, I get 12 donuts. You see how the word dozen is a number that designates Dozen is a word that designates a number, and that number is 12. When I open a ream of paper, a ream of paper to put in the copy machine, I'm opening 500 sheets. It's a word that designates a number. If I have a pair of mittens, I know that I have two mittens. If I have a gross of nails, I have a dozen dozen, that is a 
144. So one gross is equivalent to 144. So the, the story is we have many different words that we're familiar with that represent specific counting units. If the word is dozen, you think 12. If the word is ream, we think 500. If the, room is, if the word is gross, it's 144. And a pair represents two. When I'm counting in chemistry and that I'm counting these individual interactive molecular particles called atoms or compounds, and I want to know how many I have, I count by weighing. And the secret here is this chemical quantity known as the mole. Just as the word dozen represents 12, the word mole represents 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd representative particles. This is a number known as Avogadro's number. Avogadro is an Italian scientist and this is an honorary unit in his name. One mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Just as the word dozen means 12, the word mole means 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. That's known as Avogadro's number. So let's put this in perspective. I mentioned that if I weighed out on the scale exactly 12 grams of carbon. So picture this right here on top of a digital scale and it's reading 12.00 grams. I have exactly one mole of carbon. I have exactly the equivalent in grams as its atomic weight from the periodic table. I have in terms of carbon, remember its atomic mass is 12. If I weigh out the equivalent in grams as its gram atomic mass from the periodic table, I have exactly one mole of that particular substance. This is an example of carbon. And how many particles would I have on that scale? I'd have exactly 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles. This number is the number of atoms necessary so that when I weigh out, it reads 12 grams for the atomic weight of carbon. Well, let's emphasize a different element just as a different example. Let's suppose we take, we'll just kind of clear this up. Just as another example to drive home the point, let's pick another element. Um, there we go. And I'll go to the periodic table and say, let's suppose I'm going to weigh out, oh, let's just pick sulfur. Just an element close by. Sulfur, if I can read this clearly, says 32.06. Let's call it for ease 32. Its gram atomic mass, the mass I'm finding right here on the periodic table, says 32. So let's get a visual. I'm going to go to the scale and I'm going to place 32.0 grams of sulfur. Now, sulfur doesn't look like Sulfur is a bright yellow compound, a nice powdery substance. And now the scale is re reading 32 grams. How many atoms of sulfur do I have on the scale? Remember, I don't see a direct road from counting to weighing, but I do see a pathway to know how many particles I have from the scale. When I measure out the equivalent in grams of the atom sulfur, the equivalent in grams of its atomic weight of 32, I have exactly one mole of sulfur. Notice that I start with 32 grams of sulfur. That's my given quantity. And I'm literally tripping over my formula here, my conversion factor to head in the mole. I know that one mole of sulfur would weigh 32 grams. The periodic table says so. To move from the scale, which measures in grams, into the mole, we see that the molar mass is our conversion. 
The molar mass is just a vocabulary word we're just learning. It's the mass of one mole of any substance measured in grams. If my substance is sulfur, I used the periodic table to find its atomic weight of 32, so I know to put 32 grams on the scale to equate to one mole. But how many individual sulfur atoms would I have? And notice my arrow pointing out, I literally trip over my conversion factor. It says I would have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of sulfur in every one mole of sulfur. Those are equivalent values. Just as if I had put 12 over one dozen or 500 over one ream, though that number, the word mole, represents Avogadro's number. And notice what happened? We canceled grams in our first conversion. We canceled moles in our second conversion. And what would we have is one whole mole, which would be 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. Everything canceled out and we're left with Avogadro's number. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of sulfur is the same as saying one mole of sulfur is the same as saying 32 grams of sulfur. With this particular example and with the carbon, carbon we weighed out 12 grams to find a whole mole of carbon. Sulfur we weighed out 32 grams to find a whole mole of sulfur. Remember when I say one mole, it's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd individual atoms of both of those elements. What if we were to weigh out a compound like carbon dioxide? Let's suppose, and I'll just erase what we have on our scale here, the theme of our greenhouse chapter is the molecule of carbon dioxide. I might as well use it to give a first step example here. How many molecules would I need to weigh out to get a whole mole of carbon dioxide? So here's my formula, CO2. Carbon dioxide is a molecule. If I weighed out one mole of carbon dioxide, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of carbon dioxide, how much would it weigh? So let's start this journey. I'm going to tell you, let's start out by counting, which I know is impossible. We can't count individual molecules. But let's suppose we counted 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules, which is saying exactly one mole of carbon dioxide molecules. What would the scale Way. What would the grams here on the scale say? Well, remember carbon dioxide. We have a carbon. Its atomic mass was 12. And remember where I'm pulling this when I say atomic mass? Carbon has a gram atomic mass of 12. Oxygen has a gram atomic mass of 15.999. Is it all right if we just say 16? And so here, back to the scale, Carbon dioxide has one carbon, but it has two oxygens. Remember my formula, we had C double bond O in the other direction looked the same. What is the weight of this molecule? Well, it would be the sum of the individual atoms found in this molecule. 16 from the first oxygen plus 12 more on this carbon plus 16 more on this carbon. 16 plus 16 is 32. 32 and 12, this gives me a sum of 44 grams. So I would have the scale saying 44 grams. One mole of carbon dioxide would weigh 44 grams and it would be equivalent to saying an Avogadro's number of molecules. This is the story of how we count by weighing. We use a reference known as the mole. The mole is equivalent to 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Anything that you're counting could be atoms, could be molecules, 
whatever it is could be pencils whatever it is you're counting and this has a name it's called Avogadro's number one mole of carbon has a gram atomic mass of 12 grams so look at the conversion let's say we had 36 grams of carbon just to get a visual suppose we walk to the scale and if we're using just carbon and we weighed out so here we have just our elemental carbon at the scale stand there and just keep weighing to the scale said 36 grams how many moles would that be to move from mass into the mole you literally trip over your conversion factor we use the molar mass which is the weight off the periodic table the mass in grams of the element to get a whole mole carbon has a molar mass of 12 and that's what you see here we set up our conversion by saying the equivalent of one mole of carbon is 12 grams of carbon this is its molar mass or gram atomic mass of course 36 over 12 would give us 3 moles of carbon so here's our relationship the world of moles which is a counting unit the word mole represents a number it's a really 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 large number because atoms are so darn small Avogadro's number of 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd it allows me to exchange between the world of counting and our central calculation of all of chemistry the mole when I want to know how many I've weighed out, how many molecules have I weighed out, the conversion here is molar mass, the weight off the periodic table. How much would I weigh out to get one whole mole, which is an Avogadro's number? A different visual than the mole map I presented, but a really good visual as well. So let's take a peek at a sapling unit, just as a simple conversion. I have a bucket of nails that contains 432 nails. How many dozens of nails does this bucket contain? So it's just allowing me to process a conversion factor. So as usual, I just like to start with the number, 432, the unit, which is the word nail, right, 432 nails, and I want to know how many dozen there are. So here's what I know, that I have 12 nails in every one dozen. I could have 12 donuts or 12 eggs, whatever it is. The number 12 represents a dozen. So 432, I'm just going to hit that on my calculator. Please do the same. Make sure I don't make a mistake. 432 divided by 12. That came out to be 36 even, so 36 dozen nails. This was a very simple conversion, but it, it, an important ground laying event because it allows us to see the whole process of mole map work as well. Whatever we're given, we want to cancel, so it goes on the bottom. We have to set up a conversion of want over given. We wanted dozen we were given nails so we set up a conversion of equivalent values a reaction produces 0.883 moles of water I'm starting by writing my number unit and label of what is given we want to know how many molecules are produced given a mole calculate the number of molecules so again I like this visual because until we get very familiar with it we measure matter by counting and weighing and we can take a volume but not in this particular chapter we'll do that later when we do gases and their own topic but the unit that they just gave to me is the word mole right so let's review what we were just asked as I was just erasing oops went too far we're given the number of moles of water and we want to know molecules of water so the visual would say we're given the number of moles and we want to know molecules so literally I'm following the arrow out 
These little particles represent the individual molecules of water. My conversion says use Avogadro's number to move between the mole and counting. And I can see when I travel out, Avogadro will land on the top. So my given says I would have an Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of water in every one mole of water. Do you notice what we've done? We've had the unit moles cancel and we're left with the molecules. So let's think about a key sequence. I would start on my calculator by hitting 0.883 from the number of moles. Then I want to multiply by Avogadro's number. And remember this is scientific notation. And on a scientific notation calculator, we're looking for the key EE. -E. That's if you have a Texas instrument. If you have a Casio, sometimes it's an EXP key. So just depending on your calculator. But we want to hit 6.02 and then our EE -E key, 23. Please hit that with me to make sure we're getting a common answer because sometimes we might think we're going to hit that correctly but end up with a calculator error. One of the most common mistakes I see is some people like to put a times right here, 6.02 times EE. Don't do that. You just go 6.02 EE directly, then the number 23. So 0 0.883 times 6.02 then I hit second function comma to see my EE key, 23rd power. And my final answer says 5.32 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of water. Moles times Avogadro got us to the number of molecules. Suppose we're given the mass of one mole of the following elements. How much would you weigh out? Well, this is really just reminding us of the definition called molar mass. How much would you weigh out to get one whole mole of osmium? Well, stare down that periodic table with me and find the element called osmium. Osmium on the periodic table is number 76. This is a pretty difficult one to read, so I'm going to flip to my book. Number 76 is the element osmium. 190.2 is what my periodic table says. So here I would weigh out 190.2 grams, the mass of one whole mole of the element osmium. How about boron? Boron on the periodic table is number five. Its gram atomic mass, if you find it with me, 10.81. So here I would weigh out 10.81 grams for the element boron. And one more says, how much would you weigh out to get a whole mole of geranium? <laughs> germanium? GE number 32. Find it on your periodic table. Do you see its molar mass written? 72.61. So therefore, the mass I would weigh out to get one whole mole, 72.61 grams. Let's convert between moles and grams of aluminum. If we're given 0 0.0191 moles of the element called aluminum, how many grams would I have? So let's remember the visual called our mole map. The unit given this time is the mole. Oops, I want that to come up. And I want to know how much it weighs. So if I'm at the mole and want to head out to the scale, I'm going to multiply by the molar mass. Notice the molar mass is the unit up here. So I have to do a little legwork and find aluminum, which is 26.98. Yep, 26.98. You want to just round a little bit, call that 27. You don't have to, but I will. 
I want mole to cancel, so it goes on the bottom. And I know that 26.98 or 27 grams of aluminum is equivalent to one mole of aluminum. These are equivalent values. This is called the molar mass of aluminum. How much you would weigh out to get one whole mole is its gram atomic mass off the periodic table. So I'm going to hit on the calculator. Please do it with me to be sure I'm doing it correctly. 0 0.0191 times 27. And that screen tells me 0.5157, thinking significant digit, so that's 3 sig fig, so I'll round to 516 grams of aluminum. You're doing good work. How many atoms are in 151 grams of calcium? Here my given unit is grams of calcium. If you're a visual learner like me, let's plot our course. I want to know how many atoms. I have to get all the way over here, but the unit they started, we, started me with was grams. I don't see a direct route, but I do see a way to get there. I have to go into the mole first and then back out using Avogadro. We have two conversions to move from the scale to the counting unit. We'll divide by molar mass of calcium, multiply by the number of particles using Avogadro. So while we're right here, let's grab calcium's gram atomic mass. The weight I would weigh out to get one whole mole, and that looks like 40.0, 40.1, we'll call it 40. So I'm going to do that in my first step. I know that one mole of calcium would weigh 40 grams. The gram atomic mass of calcium, that vocabulary word, just to keep reminding, is called the molar mass. The mass in grams of one whole mole of that element. Grams canceled, we're at the mole. I want mole to cancel, and to do that, I've got to place it on the bottom. And when I'm counting, I have to put Avogadro up on the top. And I have atoms of calcium that will come out. So just think of your key sequence with this two-step uh, problem on your calculator. We're going to start by hitting 151 times 1 over 40. You could just hit divide by 40 times 1 won't change anything, so I'm just going to divide by 40, 151, divide by 40, and now we're going to multiply, because Avogadro is on the top, 6.02, scientific notation key, 23. Hit it with me so we make sure we're getting a common answer. 151 grams of calcium divided by the molar mass of calcium, which is 40, times Avogadro's number, 6.02 E23. And my screen says 2 point, whoops. I don't know why it did that, but let's clean it up. We have 6.0, oh, Linda. <laughs> Thank you for your patience because I just wrote what I was trying to solve for right there again. The screen says 2.27 times 10 to the 24th, and my unit ends up being atoms of calcium. We divided by molar mass and then multiplied by Avogadro. And the reason we did that, just to remind ourselves visually, we divided to get into the mole, multiplied to get back out of the mole. Classify each compound by the number of chlorine atoms indicated in the chemical formula. This is a little practice in just simply counting. If I see NaCl, sodium chloride, how many chlorine atoms do you find? Well, again, with just a subscript of one, I would put this compound right here in this category. There's one chlorine in that formula. 
C C L two F two. How many chlorines do you count in that whole formula? I agree. There'd be two chlorines. C C L two F two contains two chlorines. H C L O two. I count just one. Now we have a parenthesis, and this practice is really involved as a first step in calculating molar mass. Remember that a parenthesis is going to distribute the two throughout everything in there. So this particular compound, ClO3 taken twice, gives us two total chlorines. There would be one calcium, two chlorines, and six oxygens. So Ca, ClO3, taken twice, has two groups of chlorine. Why did I hop over this one? Let's back up. CR, ClO3, taken three times. That three distributes here. So here we would have CR, ClO3, taken three times. That three communicates inside that parenthesis to give us a total of three chlorines. I'd have three chlorines and nine oxygens. This one I did. PCL5, I agree, right here. PCL5 gives us five chlorines. Here's one with PCL4 or CCL4, carbon tetrachloride. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Who did I miss? HClO2, Cl2, NaCl, chromium chlorate, calcium chlorate taken twice, PCl5. Oops, I missed this guy, didn't I? Calcium chloride, he would be a two carbon guy. That's easy enough, don't you think? The purpose here was to remind us that we had, in a parenthesis situation, to distribute. Distribute means to multiply through that parenthesis. What is the mass of exactly one mole of the following elements? What we're being asked to do here is to sum all the individual elements to add up to be one whole mole. For instance, on the periodic table, when you find nitrogen, nitrogen has a gram atomic mass of 14. So let me just hit that again. On the periodic table, nitrogen has a gram atomic mass of 14. Since we're here, I'll just grab oxygen as well. Oxygen is 16. So when I'm using those values, what I'm doing is putting in the gram atomic mass. But how many n's are there in that formula? Well, there's two of them. We have to add both of those nitrogens together. Oxygen, we said, has a gram atomic mass of 16. But how many total oxygen atoms are there? Well, there's five. I'm going to sum 14 times 2 plus 16 times 5. So on my calculator, I let that do the work for me. 14 times 2 plus 16 times 5. And this has a gram atomic mass, a molar mass of 108 grams. To weigh out 108 grams of N2O5, I'd have exactly one mole of N2O5. This is FeClO3 taken three times. Fe on the periodic table is 55.8. So backing up, here's where iron lives. Iron is 55.8 on the periodic table. That's just where I'm pulling them. There's just one of them. Chlorine on the periodic table, find it with me, is 35.5. But there's three of them in this formula because outside that parenthesis distributes a three. And the final one there is oxygen, who has a gram atomic weight of 16. But I'm counting three because remember this three distributes through the parenthesis. I want to add up the weight of one iron, three chlorines, and three oxygens. Do it with me. 55.8 plus 35.5 times 3 plus 16 times 3. And the grand total there, 
0.3. So I would weigh out 210.3 grams. Same idea here, one iron, two chlorine, and four oxygens. You'd add the sum of all of those weights and find its molar mass. Here's another example. You're going to see many of these in your sapling. We want to weigh out a manganese, we want to weigh out a chlorine, and we have oxygen. Alrighty, so we just have to use our periodic table and find the weights of each of these elements and remember how many there are. So on the periodic table, we'll find manganese. Manganese is a transition element. Here it is. It's number 25. And this slide is kind of blurry, so I'm going to the periodic table. 54.94. How many manganese do you see? Well, there's just one. Chlorine, 35.5. And how many do you see? Remember that two distributes, so there's two of them. An oxygen with its weight of 16, but I'm counting four. I want you to just simply add that up, and you'll have the gram per mole, which we refer to as molar mass. How much would you weigh out to get one whole mole of the substance? 54.94. 35.5 times 2 plus 16 times 4. And when I summed that, I found 189.94 grams, approximately 190. Here we're given the number of moles of a compound, and we'd like to know how many grams it corresponds to. It's a mole map problem, isn't it? We're given a mole and we want to know grams. This time we're going to use the molar mass of the whole compound. So what we have to do to solve this problem, we have to add up a molar mass and then travel the journey. There it goes. So our given quantity, 0.764 moles of sodium carbonate, which is Na2CO3. My conversion will say I want moles to cancel and I need the molar mass on top. So we'll go to work using the periodic table. Finding Na on the periodic table, I can see it's 23, but there's two of them. Carbon weighs 12, and there's just one of them in that formula. Oxygen weighs 16, and there's three of them in that formula. Add the sum of each individual atom's weight. Two sodiums at 23 apiece, one carbon weighing 12, and three oxygens weighing 16 apiece. What's that grand total? 23 times 2. plus 12, plus 16 times 3. I get 106 as my gram atomic mass right here. That's my conversion factor. It's called the molar mass, the mass of one mole of the element. Now our given quantity, 0.764, will be multiplied by our molar mass of 106 and just considering this key sequence to solve this problem. So I start by hitting my 0.764 moles of sodium carbonate times 106 grams per mole and it says 80.984 which would be equivalent to saying 81 grams of sodium carbonate. We have many of these. Liz, here we have magnesium silicate. We're given 217 grams of our compound magnesium silicate, SiO3. I want to know how many moles that is. So I'm going to just set up my conversion so I can see my journey. I want to go from the grams to the mole. 
So do you see what we're doing? Going from the grams into the mole, we have to divide by molar mass. When we divide by molar mass, we have to sum the weights of all the elements from the periodic table. Magnesium, 24.3. Silicon, we can call 28. Oxygen, we can call 16. Can we remember those as we slide down? Magnesium was 24.3. There's just one of them. Silicon was 52. Shoot, I forgot. Silicon was 28. I wasn't even close. And oxygen is 16, but now we have three of them. So I'm going to add up the weight of one magnesium, the weight of one silicon, and the weight of three oxygens. So 24.3 plus 28 plus 48 it gives us a total weight of 100.3. I know that has to go on the bottom so the gram unit cancels and I arrive at the mole. 217 divided by 100.3 and we have our mole value of 2.16 moles of magnesium silicate. We'll do one more mole map problem so it can be taking uh, lots of practice. What is the mass in grams of this many molecules of methanol? So let's figure out what they're telling us. Back to the mole map. We're given the number of molecules. We have to get into the mole and out to the scale. We have to head in and then out. This is a two-step conversion. We'll need to know Avogadro's number to head in and we'll need to know molar mass to head out. So I see this particular problem with two steps involved. Let's start by writing 9.94 times 10 to the 24th. That's our given quantity. And the unit is a molecule. And of what is methanol, CH3OH? I want to go into the mole so it goes on top. I need it to cancel so Avogadro goes on the bottom. We would have an Avogadro's number of molecules in every one mole. Then we need the molar mass up on top to do our two-step conversion. Carbon has a molar mass of 12. There's just one of them. Hydrogen weighs 1 on the periodic table, but I see a total of 4 in this formula. Oxygen has an atomic weight of 16, and I see just one of them in this formula. So 12 plus 4 plus 16 is 32. It has a molar mass of 32 grams. We divide by Avogadro, multiply by molar mass, Let's hit this together to see if we can't find a common answer. 9.94, scientific notation key is E to the 24th power, divided by 6.02, scientific notation key is the E button, 23 for Avogadro's power, times the molar mass of 32, and the scale would be reading 528.4 grams of methanol. 528.4 grams of methanol. Here I can finally get to a next part of our lesson and they show some examples of what's called percent composition. How much does each element contribute to the weight of the whole compound is known as its percent composition. And I just think of percent as part over whole the weight of each element and its contribution to the weight of the whole compound. So let's model this in terms of a compound called aluminum hydroxide. This compound contains the element aluminum, 
How much does the element aluminum contribute by mass to the weight of the whole compound? Of course, I see oxygen in this compound as well. How much does the weight of oxygen contribute to the whole compound? It's called its percent composition. And the third element would be hydrogen. So here we know aluminum, on the periodic table, if you find aluminum, it has an atomic weight of 27. And I see just one of them in the formula. Oxygen has an atomic weight of 16, but there's three of them in the formula. Remember how that 3 will distribute through the parentheses. And hydrogen has an atomic weight of 1, and there's 3 of them. What is the sum total of the compound called aluminum hydroxide, ALOH, taken 3 times? So I would sum 27 plus the 48 from oxygen plus 3 from the hydrogen. The total weight is 78. This is what we would refer to as the molar mass of aluminum hydroxide. So now we have all the information we need to find part over whole. So the percent composition, let's do aluminum first because it's just written up here first. Its contribution was 27 grams out of the weight of the whole compound which was 78 expressed as a percent. And if I did the same idea with the oxygen percent composition, we would take its contribution of 48 grams out of the total of 78 grams, and you'd multiply that by 100 to get a percent. And of course, the hydrogen percent composition would be its part over whole, would be its contribution of 3 over 78 expressed as a percent. Let's take a quick peek at the numbers we find. So first to do aluminum, I would hit 27 divided by 78 times 100. 34 point, and it says do 3 sig fig, so 34.6. Forty eight over seventy eight times a hundred sixty one point five. And there's one more, and that's the hydrogen three divided by seventy eight times a hundred, and that's three point eight. Now, just as a double check, are we close to 100 percent? 3.8 plus 61.5 plus 34.6. Oops, plus. I got 99.9, .9, and that's just by rounding these differences here. So 99.9 uh, .9 is pretty close to saying that's 100 percent of the overall weight. So we just practiced a percent composition, each element's contribution to the weight of the total compound, part over whole. And remember, you'll have just as many answers as there are elements in that particular formula. You'll have the same practice opportunity here. You'll find the mass of sodium. You'll find the mass of chlorine. You'll find the mass of oxygen, noting that there's two of them. You'll sum their total, each total here, get the grand total, and just take part over whole, part over whole, part over whole, and you'll have those percentages to report just as they had worked in the previous problem. Here we're going to use a percent composition to actually use a conversion factor. So this is a little different, so let me take the time to kind of talk this strategy through. 885 grams of lithium oxide, Li2O, and what I want to know, remember want goes on top and given goes on the bottom. I want grams of the oxygen out of the whole compound.
So I go to the scale and I weigh out 885 grams of a compound, but it has two different atoms in it, lithium and oxygen. Out of this 885, how many of these grams are just coming from the oxygen atoms? Well, it's just a mass percentage of Li2O. When I find lithium on the periodic table, its molar mass is 6.9. You might round to 7, but I see two of them in the formula. And oxygen has a molar mass of 16. So I'm going to hit 6.9 times 2 plus 16. And that gives me 29.8, depending on how you round it there. So the whole compound has a molar mass of 29.8 and the oxygen contribution is 16. Notice this conversion factor is just the percent composition of oxygen. It's part over whole. Because see what happens? We cancel the grams of the whole compound and have converted to grams of the element oxygen. If our question had asked for grams of lithium, we would place its part over whole to pull out the lithium atoms. 885 times 16 divided by 29.8. And this answer on my screen is 475. And I'll round to 0 0.2. Great work. Here's an opportunity to really test your skills with percent by mass. We're asked for the highest percent nitrogen to the lowest percent nitrogen. So we're going to have to work quite a bit here to find the mass percentage of nitrogen in each one of these compounds. Let me model what I mean. The first salt here is potassium nitrate. So the first element would be potassium. Then I'd have a nitrogen. And then I'd have an oxygen, which there's three of them. Find the total, so I'm going to do 39 plus 14 plus 16 times 3. Its total weight is 101. And all this can be done on your calculator. So the percent by mass of nitrogen would be its weight, 14, divided by the total of 101 times 100, and right now it says 13.86. There's your percent of nitrogen. We'll have to do it again and again and again and again and again. You're going to find the mass percents. And when you do, you're just solving for nitrogen. So find the total weight, part over whole for just nitrogen, and you'll rank those. And you'll just click and grab from the highest percentage to the lowest percentage. We're ending our lesson here with our calculations. We have one more lesson that will just simply bring conclusion to our greenhouse gases and their effect on our environment. Great work today. Go to work on your sapling and complete it up.